das Zeuge und so und Säge, das Zeug mit mir. Oh, 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 oh.
the tempest, out of the seething waters. So far the gods protect me here in this lonely haven. I kneel and thank the God for their assistance. But what avail this thrill of mere existence? Thus the rest of my cohort, thus the rest of my legion, from conquest after conquest, is this the triumph? Alone in these death-like regions, like the flash of a meteor, and Jesus Oh, we 
mentre io fremo le belle forme di giù
make up a game You know, baby, there's no maybe I love only you You're the only one And no one else will do It makes me grieve when you turn me away I'm sorry, but you don't understand You won't believe anything that I say I'm sorry that you can't understand Open up your heart, let me in your heart I'm pleading No one else will do, cause it's only you I'm needing Then you will see all the great things I've planned I'm sorry, but you don't understand Jim, Jack and Lou, we were speaking of you I'm sorry, but you don't understand My little baby, I'd be satisfied Stay by your side Oh, I'm sorry That you can't understand I'm so blue And sorry that we parted Let's make up And go back like we started your mother, too, knows I'm wild about you. I'm sorry, but you don't understand.
a bird in a tree who wouldn't be when you're with me seems you stop the rain with a smile my skies are blue because of you though up or down dear I never will frown with you around there is nothing to fear not complaining life is worthwhile when you are near clouds disappear I'm not worrying no I'm not worrying as long as I have you no No more fretting as long as I have you, my dearie. I will always be true, blue. I'm so happy because I'm in heaven. I'm with you, I'm not worrying, no, I'm not worrying as long as I have you. I'm not worrying, no, I'm not worrying. I'm not worrying as long as I 
I'm in heaven when I'm with you. I'm not worrying, no, I'm not worrying as long as I have you.
the latch key under the door Rust him away every day since you've been gone mm, Come on home, you'll find a welcome waiting you here After you've loaded your best and tethered your nest in that northern atmosphere Wherever you go, whatever you do No matter what people say If you get broke, clothes and soak And all your skies are gray Just come on home You'll find the latch key under the door Rusting away every day since you've been gone The uh, first words I spoke in the original phonograph A uh, little piece of practical poetry Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. This is Charles Edison speaking. The Adiphone Jubilee song by our old friends Billy Jones and Ernest Hare is a happy prelude to the celebration of the 50th year of our great industry. It is my father that should be talking to you now. He could tell you of his dreams as a young inventor when, 50 years ago, he talked at the first dictating machine. He could explain the problems he solved one by one in obtaining mastery of the art. And I'm sure he could tell you of how proud he is of your successful Ediphone organization with worldwide service this year of our jubilee. There seems to be some kind of a fate which directed this industry through its early days and even follows us now in our more rapid growth. The tinfoil model of 1877 could not have been developed into the modern Ediphone of today without the distribution of electrical energy to every office desk. And so in those days at Menlo Park we find Edison lighting being developed almost as a contributory invention to the dictating machine. Even Scholes, with his early typewriter, came to the Edison shop for assistance. And surely it is good fortune that has brought together in the Ediphone organization this group of sterling businessmen who have pioneered and built our good reputation for field service. But at present, we are concerned with celebrating the year 1927, which marks the 50th year of our progress. There is one fitting way to do this, not by dwelling upon our inheritance of originality, nor seeking praise for our past performances, but by performing the greatest telephone service of all the years of our enterprise as a very definite proof of our progress. I'm sure that everyone engaged in the Ediphone industry feels this ambition with me and will direct his efforts so that he may look back at this historic year of 1927 with the greatest pride. Individually, we should know what is expected of us to reach this common goal of a Jubilee sales record. This goal is expressed in the Jubilee quota which every one of us will have, from Mr. Edison to the newest worker. We will perform these jubilee quotas with enthusiasm and in the spirit of celebration. Remember, we are not entering upon this jubilee year without preparation. The Adiphone itself will be in jubilee dress, bearing the grand prize awarded at Philadelphia. Factory and field workers will be multiplied. Publicity will keep pace with performance. And with that jubilee spirit to make every day full of accomplishments, this year will mark our most advanced step in Ediphone service. 
Father and I wish to thank everyone in the industry for his cooperation as we march to success through our Jubilee year. There is no body of our people who increased the more inexorably interwoven with the interest of all. And here's the case of the box. The country rights commission should be revived with great leaves of these powers. Its abandonment was a severe blow to the interests of all. The welfare of the farmer is a basic need of this nation. It is the men from the farm who in the past have taken the lead in every great movement within this nation, whether in time of war or in time of peace. It is well to have our cities prosper, but it is not well if they prosper at the expense of the country. In this movement, the lead must be taken for the farmer themselves. But our people as a whole, through their governmental agencies, should back the farmer. Everything possible should be done to better the economic condition of the farmer, and also to increase the social value and the life of the farmer, the farmer's wife and their children. The burdens of labor and loneliness bear heavily on the women in the country. Their welfare should be the special concern of all of us. Everything possible should be done to make life in the country possible so as to be attractive from the economic standpoint. And there should be just the same chance to live as full and well-rounded and as highly useful lives in the country as in the city. The government must cooperate with the farmer to make the farm more productive. There must be no skinning of the soil. The farm should be left to the farmer done in better and not worse conditions because of its cultivation. Moreover, every invention and improvement, every discovery in the economy should be at the service of the farmer in the work of production. And in addition, he should be helped to cooperate in business fashion with his fellows, so that the money paid by the consumer for the products of the soil shall, to as large a degree as possible, go into the pockets of the man who raised that product. So long as the farmer leaves cooperative activities with their profit sharing to the city man of business, so long will the foundations of wealth be undermined and the comforts of enlightenment be impossible in the country community. The present conditions of business cannot be accepted as satisfactory. There are too many who do not prosper enough. And of the few who prosper greatly, there are certainly some whose prosperity does not seem well for the country. Rational progressives, no matter how radical, are well aware that nothing the government can do will make some men prosper and be utterly a fool of prosperity, no matter how great of any man if it comes as an instant surrendering service to the community. But we wish to shape conditions so that a greater number of the small men in business, the decent, respectable, industrious and energetic men who conduct small businesses, who are retail traders, who run small stores and shops, shall be able to succeed and so that the big man who is dishonest shall not be allowed to succeed at all. Our aim is to control business, not to strangle it, and above all, not to continue a policy of make-believe strangles toward big concerns that do evil, and constant menace toward both big and little concerns that do well. Our aim is to promote prosperity, and then to see that prosperity is passed around that there is a proper division of prosperity. We wish to control big business so as to secure, among other things, good wages for the wage workers and reasonable prices for the consumer. We will not submit to the prosperity that is obtained by lowering the wages of working men and charging an excessive price to consumers, nor to that other kind of prosperity obtained by swindling investors or getting unfair advantages over business rights. We propose to make it worthwhile for our businessmen to develop the most efficient business agencies. But we propose to make these business agencies do complete justice to our old people. We are against crooked business, big or little. We are in favor of honest business, big or little. We propose to penalize conduct and not size. The great fundamental issue now before our people can be seen with. It is, are the American people fit to govern themselves, to rule themselves, to control themselves? I believe they are. My opponents do not. I believe in the right of the people to rule. 
I believe that the majority of the plain people of the United States will day in and day out make fewer mistakes in governing themselves than any smaller class or body of men, no matter what their training, will make in trying to govern. I believe again that the American people are as a whole capable of self-control and of learning by their mistakes. Our opponents say lip loyal to this doctrine, but they show their real belief by the way in which they champion every device to make the nominal rule of the people a sham. I am not leading this fight as a matter of aesthetic pleasure. I am leading because somebody must lead or else the fight would not be made at all. I prefer to work with moderate, with rational conservatives, provided only that they do in good faith drive forward towards the light. But when they halt and turn their backs to the light, sit with the scorners on the seats of reaction, then I must part company with them. We, the people, cannot turn back. Our aim must be steady, wise, but it would be well if our people would study the history of a sister republic. All the woes of France for a century and a quarter have been due to the folly of her people in splitting into the two camps of unreasonable conservatism and unreasonable radicalism. Had free revolutionary France listened to men like Giorgio and backed them up, all would have gone well. But the beneficiaries of privilege, the Bourbon reactionaries, the short sighted ultra conservatives turned down Giorgio and then found that instead of him they had obtained Robespierre. They gained 20 years freedom from all restraint and reform at the cost of the whirlwind of the Red Terror, and in their turn the unbridled extremists of the terror induced a blind reaction. And so with convulsion and oscillation from one extreme to another, with alternations of violent radicalism and violent bourbonism, the French people went through misery toward a shattered soul. May we profit with the experiences of our brother Republicans across the water, and go forward steadily avoiding all wild extremes. And may our ultra-conservatives remember that the rule of the Bourbon brought on the revolution. And may our would-be revolutionaries remember that no Bourbon was ever such a dangerous enemy of the people and of freedom as the professed friend of both Robert there. There is no danger of a revolution in this country, but there is grave discontent and unrest, and in order to remove them there is need of all the wisdom and probity and peace in faith and purpose to uplift humanity we have at our command. Friends, our task as Americans is to strive for social and industrial justice achieved through the genuine rule of the people. This is our end, our purpose. The methods for achieving the end are merely expedient, to be finally accepted or rejected according as actual experience shows that they work well or ill. But in our hearts we must have this lofty purpose to strive for it in all earnestness and sincerity for our work will come to us. In order to succeed, we need leaders of inspired idealism, leaders to whom are granted great visions, who dream greatly and strive to make their dreams come true, who can kindle the people with the fire from their own burning souls. The leader for the time being, whoever he may be, is but an instrument to be used until broken and then to be cast aside. And if he is worth his salt, he will care no more when he is broken than a soldier cares when he is sent where his life is profit in order that the victory may be won. In the long fight for righteousness, the watchword for all of us is spend and be spent. Thomas A. Edison, the inventor of the phonograph, has never before permitted his voice to be recorded for the public. Today, however, he has a message for you that is important enough to cause him to break his long-established groove. Mr. Edison will now give you that message. I beg to introduce Mr. Thomas A. Edison. This is Edison speaking. Our boys made good in France. The word American has a new meaning in Europe. Our soldiers have made it mean courage, generosity, self-restraint, and modesty. We are proud of the North Americans who risked their lives for the liberty of the world. But we must not forget and we must not permit demagogues to belittle the part played by our gallant allies. Their casualty lists tell the story. However proud we may be of our own achievements, let us remember always that the war could not have been won 
if the Belgians, the British, the French, and the Italians had not fought like bulldogs in the face of overwhelming odds. The Great War will live vividly in the minds of Americans for the next hundred years. I hope that when we do reverence to the memory of our brave boys who fell in France, we shall not forget that their brothers in arms who wore the uniform of our allies. I believe that the national heirs of France, Great Britain, Italy, and Belgium should for all time to come be as familiar to us as our own star-spangled banner. Thank you, have you tried the pretzel ride? Thank you, have you tried the pretzel ride? Thank you for a thrill, try the wildcat. Thank you for a thrill, try the wildcat. Thank you, want fun, try the scooter. Thank you, want fun, try the scooter. Thank you, for real fun, try the whip. Thank you, for real fun, try the whip. Thank you, have a ride on the old mill. Thank you, have a ride on the old mill. Thank you, try our popcorn. Thank you, try our popcorn.
Good morning, Paisan. Uh, buongiorno, Sino. Come state? Oh, I'm fine. Come state yourself, Paisan. Oh, molto bene, molto bene. Hey, what are you doing anyhow? Are you working? Oh, boss, I got a fine a job now. Yeah? I'm a politician. What do you mean you're a politician? Oh, I got a swell a job. I politician the bully boss, you know? <laughs> Paisan. What? I ask you something. You know, where's a restaurant? Why, Joe, what kind do you want? A nice place, you cabish. Where they make a nice Italian dish. Well, now there's Tony, do you see? Where, where? Two blocks down the street. Ah, uh, goodbye. That's the place for me. Well, what are you going to eat? Pasta, fazula. Will you tell me what you mean? Sure, sure. Pasta, fazula. Noodle and a navy bean. First antipasto. I must order it sometime. And then you must have Italian wine. Pasta, fazula. Make a weaker man a strong. Pasta, fazula. Make you live a very long. You want to be a great a big chic? Yes. Make the women bite to your cheek? Sure. Don't be a fool. Eat pasta fazool. It's very good. Oh, excellent. Good, huh? Yes, sir. Now, Paisan, you want something great? Sure, come on, I'll have a plate. I'll bet you my barber shop. Yes, I'll, I'll take one bite and then I'll stop. Now, waiter, he's uh, make a hurry up, please. Well, uh, don't be so foolish. Now, uh, what for you ask uh, what do we want to eat? Just, Just bring us one big dish. La, 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 la. La very good to eat. Say, what makes Babe Ruth hit a home run? Why, Mr. Rockefeller, he's a make a lot of money. What makes Dean Tunney think he can fight? Why, pasta fazula, cause he eats it every night. What makes McCormick sing a high note? What made the Christopher Columbus take a nice boat? What to make a Mussolini boss of Italy? And what made Lindbergh fly across the sea? Pasta fazula. We will tell you what we mean. Pasta fazula. Noodles and a navy bean. First and the pasto. You must order it sometime. And then you must go. Have Italian wine. Pasta fazula. Make a weaker man a strong. Pasta fazula. Make you live a very long. And if you want a great big Yes, push the button from your vest. Don't be a fool, eat pasta fazool. America, what's the matter with you? Seems that you are ragging everything you do. Every day you're getting worse. Look around and see. You've become a nation of syncopation. You're not like you used to be. Ragtime has a hold on you, and I know someday when we go to see a show, it's going to be acted this way. I'll be the leading lady. Fine, then I'll be the villain. Oh, but who's going to be the hero? Well, that's easy. I'll be the hero, too. <laughs> You're a modest little fellow, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> that's what they all say. Uh, well, uh, here we go. I'm alone in the house. Quiet as a mouse. There's no one around. Nobody here. Nobody near. Who made that sound? I declare someone there over there by that chair. Who can it be? It's Bill the villain. He's always willing for any rat callous he. Oh, go, go away or I shall scream. Help! Woman, 
woman, woman, woman, this is the hour. At last my life support you got you in my power, and I'm never gonna let you be. Till you make a solemn promise that you leave your husband Thomas and come away with me. Oh, let me be, oh, let me be. I made a bet I'd get you, yet you'll be sorry, pet, that we ever met. Now I'm going to make you suffer, eat for suffer, laugh, because you got to pay your long lost debt. No, I won't. Yes, you will. No, I won't. Yes, you will. I won't. Then I shall kill. I will put this coming quick. I'm safe, it's sick. Man, your time has come, cause my dick is coming home. There's going to be a funeral if he catches us alone. Then I jump out of the window and take it on the run. Cause my dick is mighty handy with a double barrel gun. Dick, dick, hurry up quick. Get to trust your rifle and do the trick. For he's a villain, always willing to do a little killing if he could. He'd raise a cake, a bank he'd wreck. Why, he is just no good. A dick, my loving husband, I've been waiting here for you. You nearly lost your baby doll to love and answer true. Was he trying hard to trifle? I'll let him have my rifle. Bang, bang, bang and, and the dam is all through. The 
Thank you.